amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now am found was blind but been here a thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing your praise than when we first God's grace. Thank you so much, Judy. That's one of my favorite songs. Glad you sang that this morning. Welcome to our worship at Why Not First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Mark Miller. I'm so glad to be with you in worship this morning. In fact, that reminds us that reminds me that the the psalmist wrote, This is the day. The Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so I am glad, I hope that you are glad to be together to worship this morning. Want to invite you to rise to your feet and rise in your hearts as well as we continue to be glad in our worshiping. Say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. 
sacrifice of praise. In fact, it says in Hebrews 13, verse 15, those very words, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. But then it says continually, you may be seated, not just let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God once, like we're doing in worship, but then we continue to offer the sacrifice of praise throughout the week, and throughout our lives. And that's why we don't apologize in offering and making sure that you know the various ways and opportunities that we have to continue to be the church throughout the week. Because we don't just offer the sacrifice of praise once and go home, but we continue to offer the sacrifice of praise. And we offer praise to God by being the church. And always let you know of the mission of the month and the mission of the month for March is and has been UMCOR. And we thank you for giving towards UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. And that's a a wonderful opportunity for us to give because our uh, apportionments, our giving to the United Methodist Church covers uh, the salaries and so forth of UMCOR, people who work for UMCOR, therefore 100% of what we give to projects for UMCOR goes to that very need. In fact, one of those needs is an urgent appeal that UMCOR UMCOR is sharing with us, and that urgent appeal is to uh, Ukraine. And so that's actually a separate offering that we're enabling uh, you to give to and to support is, uh, you know, there's a mission of the month which is for UMCOR, generally speaking, but specifically, there's an urgent appeal through UMCOR to give and to support the people who are suffering in, um, through Ukraine. And so we offer that opportunity for you as well. And another opportunity as Easter is quickly approaching is that we will have Easter flowers to beautify our sanctuary and we give you an opportunity to support that and to make that happen. And so out in the narthex, there are slips of paper to order those flowers, those Easter flowers, and they are $10 per plant. 
and the deadline to do so is April 10th. And you can order those online as well in uh, your giving. Just indicate that uh, that giving is for the flowers. Or if you're giving towards the Ukraine, then indicate that it's the giving is for uh, Ukraine. And you can't write, write it in the memo <laughs> on the check if you're giving online, so you can indicate uh, you're doing so as well. So we thank you for supporting the church. We thank you for being the church. And we thank you for giving, not just financially, but giving of our very selves and giving our, of our spiritual gifts that God has instilled in us through the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer together. We are so amazed, O oh God, at the heartfelt wisdom of your son Jesus and his response to his disciples as they question their importance to him and to his kingdom. They want to know if they will be recognized and if they will be praised for their accomplishments and they question their importance concerning the kingdom of God. And forgive us, O oh God, when we have such an attitude. We are so much like those early disciples. We want you to know how hard we work. We want to compare ourselves sometimes to the efforts of others and the gifts of which they are spiritually blessed. But then Jesus placed a small child in their midst, a child who is so innocent, with no agenda, no pretense. And we remember that Jesus said, whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me is actually welcoming the one who has sent me. It is our desire to bring glory and honor to you, Lord, and to your Father who sent you. Help us to reach out to others, not with the thought of importance, not with the idea of, of gain, but rather in love and in compassion, truly caring for one another as we meet them on the street or wherever we see them and experience them in our lives. Give us the spirit of an innocent child and create in us hearts of genuine love for others and in service to you, O Lord. O God, we pray for those who need you physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We pray for those who suffer under persecution, for those who are without food and water, and we look for ways that we can make a difference in their lives, physically and spiritually. Today we lift to you, especially those who are escaping from the threat of war, especially the millions of children who have had to flee for their lives in Ukraine. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you for giving us hearts that are missionally minded and for showing us always that we can make a difference in our very community. We want to be your hands and your feet in our present world. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and your Son, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
so much, Judy. So much truth and promise in that song. Hey, if I were to ask you to complete the sentence, you know it's going to be a bad day, when, what would your response be? Let me give you a couple examples. You know it's going to be a bad day when your hong stick sticks and you're on I-75 and the 32 Hells Angels behind you. You know it's going to be a bad day when you get to work and the 60 Minutes crew is waiting for you. You know it's going to be a bad day when the worst player on the golf course wants to play you for money. <laughs> you know it's going to be a bad day when you turn on the evening news and they're showing evacuation routes out of your city. And you know it's going to be a bad day when your twin sister forgets your birthday. You know, we can, we can laugh at, at some of those silly suggestions, but we all know that we sometimes have those bad days and they're anything but funny <laughs> when they actually happen. So we're examining the cross of Jesus Christ during this Lenten season as we are approaching Easter. And as we have established, we have bad days sometimes. We realize, in fact, we live in a culture where we know that we will be faced by suffering. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we, know, we do know it's going to happen at some time, at some point. And Paul is suffering for the church when he writes these words. I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. And you see that's from Colossians chapter 1. Paul is suffering for the church, as I said, but it's because he is serving uh, the church and it's his choice because he has said yes to the calling from God. And it's Paul's choice that is based on a mature love. It's based on what we might call a cross love. And that's what I want to speak to you a little bit about this morning is cross love, a mature love. And we might say uh, that it's uh, an agape love. We use that word oftentimes. And we recognize that it's a, a Christ love, a cross love. And here's what it says in Mark 8 about that, what Jesus says to us. Then he called a crowd to him along with his disciples <clears throat> and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? So do you see that cross love is a mature love. The kind of love that Jesus tells about is a sacrificial love. And it's the kind of love that we ought to share together as a church, and especially a kind of love that we ought to share outside the walls of our church, in our community, in our world. It's this kind of love that drew Jesus to the cross. I want to share that scripture actually from Mark 15 about the crucifixion of Jesus. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. 
It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself and come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. So cross love, I'll say it again, it's a mature love. It's an agape love, as we call it. It's a love that uh, all of us realize that Jesus died and suffered for all of us because all of us, each one of us, is who put Jesus on the cross. And what I want to share with you this today is that cross love requires three attributes. Cross training, cross bearing, and crossing over. First of all, cross training is a term we use when we physically work out. It takes on a little different meaning we think, when we think of the cross training. What's the greatest truth that we know from the Bible when we think of cross love? The greatest truth, and we've shared this over and over, is the greatest commandment. And we remind ourselves to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind, and what else? To love our neighbor as ourselves. That's where cross-training begins. The greatest theologian that America has produced is Jonathan Edwards. And he said about Christians in the 18th century, it's easier to get them to talk like saints than to act like saints. (laughs) Do you think that's true today also? Cross-training means to put Christ's love into action. Put on your cross-training shoes, or we might say to put on your be like Jesus shoes. In vacation Bible school a few years ago, uh, at the church where I was at at the time, we learned a song called, Put On Your Be Like Jesus Shoes. And I thought that was a very, very cute, amazing song. So I want to share it with you. <clears throat> it goes like this. I'm going to put on my be like Jesus shoes. I'm going to put on my be like Jesus shoes. You share the Bible with a friend and a helping hand, spreading joy all around. I'm going to put on my be like Jesus shoes. Oh, won't you put on your be like Jesus shoes? Yeah, the kids really like that. And I like that song too. And I always think of that when I think about being like Jesus or when I think about cross love and in particular, uh, cross training. The second attribute of cross love, uh, cross bearing love is, is, is that. It is cross-bearing love, cross-training love, and now cross-bearing love. A love that exists in spite of and not because of our sufferings. The cross has become a very familiar symbol to us, and sometimes it's become so familiar that we forget the harsh realities that it points to. It was the first century equivalent to a hanging noose, or an electric chair, and yet we like to wear crosses. We wear crosses as, as jewelry. 
We see crosses as dramatic wall hangings, and some people wear tattoos as crosses, and there are architectural statements concerning the cross as well. In fact, quite a few sanctuaries are actually shaped as a, as a cross. The last church I served was a, a sanctuary that was shaped as a cross. And as Christians, we're called not to wear crosses, but to bear crosses. And the first true cross bearer for Christ is named today in the text that we read from Mark 15 is Simon of Cyrene. But Simon didn't choose to bear the cross. Simon was pressed into service. He was ordered by the Roman soldiers to carry the cross to Golgotha. Crossbearing recognized that there is significant suffering, very genuine suffering in the world, but crossbearing helps us to understand that it's, it's because of true sacrifice that we receive and experience crossbearing and choose to understand crossbearing. And Jesus exercised the greatest power when he willingly may, became powerless on the cross. Interesting thought, isn't it? That is the power of Jesus, but he became powerless on the cross to gain that power. And the third attribute that we're considering uh, today is to cross over. And in crossing over, uh, what, what do we do when we feel threatened and when we feel insecure? We kind of build walls for security, don't we? Uh, and that's true. Sometimes if we try to cross over, we might build barriers uh, to reach around borders and make connections who are different from us and disagree with us. That becomes very difficult when we cross over into the secular world, when we cross over with the love of Christ. And so cross love is taking a risk, and I become willing to move out of my comfort zone, and cross love compels me to do so. Here's an example of crossover love. Do you remember when Amy Grant reached the peak of her popularity as a Christian artist? And do you remember what happened at the time when she reached that peak and became very popular? She crossed over into the secular market with her message of love, and she began to sing secular music, and many Christians were outraged. I remember that time very well. I, bl I believe Amy Grant is about my age, maybe just a little bit older, which means she's like 39, right? <laughs> I noticed on Facebook that one of my buddies from high school is watching our service this morning, and, and Jim is the same age as me, and I think he would agree that we're 39. <laughs> so anyway, when she crossed over into the, the secular market it, with some secular songs that she was singing, there were Christians who were mad and, and would say, how dare she cross over into the secular market with that message of, of love. And, you know, she's supposed to be singing Christian songs, not secular songs, but there were people who defended Amy Grant and who promised to pray for her. And there was one person I remember who said something I thought was very significant. One of them said, there is nothing better than a Christian to Cross, a cross, Christian crossover artist if the artist takes the crossover. You see that a crossover is go okay if they actually take the crossover. And that's what Amy Grant was doing. And that was a voice of support at that time. You, because you see it was the cross itself which is transformed into a symbol of horror, a symbol of death, but became a symbol of redemption 
and divine love because of Jesus' sacrifice. And there are ways that we can cross over and take our language of love and forgiveness and have influence in what we call the secular world. And the result in doing so is that we can change harsh language into crossover language. Now, I had that experience at one point in my life. I had the privilege of being able to write a column for a racing newspaper that was called uh, the Mark Times, M-A-R-C, Mark Times, and I wrote an article called Revving Up for Life by Reverend Mark Miller. And I wrote that each week as the paper came out on Saturdays because or maybe it came out on Fridays because many of the races were on Friday and and Saturday evenings. And by writing that newspaper article, it got me into tracks. And I prayed before the race, but also they usually would give me a pit pass. And I I realized during that time why they call it the pits, (laughs) because of the language and, and the stories that would be told at that time. And I'd always think it was kind of funny when I'd be talking with a group of people and somebody would, would stop and say to me, they say, I don't think I've, I've met you yet. And I say, well, I'm Mark Miller. Nice to meet you. And I could, it was interesting to see the look on their face as they would remember the stories or perhaps, perhaps the jokes that they were telling. And they say, do you mean the Reverend Mark Miller? I said, yes, that's me, nice to meet you. And they would apologize and try to explain away their embarrassing language. And I would always say, hey, if you're embarrassed, I'm not the one that you have offended. And I appreciated that. I I did that back in the 90s, I don't do that anymore. It meant a lot of late Saturday nights and I still have to be up on Sunday morning and I grew to the age where I couldn't do it anymore <laughs> to stay up so late and still be ready on, on Sunday morning. But it was a good time. I appreciated being able to do that and being able to cross over into the secular world. One time somebody, this is a, a sermon for another time, somebody actually gave me their race car to drive one night. And so I, was, I did so and I... I did, there was a, a race that was five laps. And so five laps to glory because I was so excited to be able to do that. I love racing and that's why I would go to those small track races and actually kind of, I kind of became like a chaplain to a lot of those uh, tracks. In fact, one of those is close by in, at, in Flat Rock. I used to go to Flat Rock when I was in junior high and high school because I grew up in Wayne and uh, really loved that experience. So representing the cross is a great opportunity to cross over into the secular and represent the love of Jesus. It's called being a witness. And I know and I appreciate that this has been such an important aspect of our church for many years, many years before I came for a long time. This has been a part of the DNA of who we are to be witness, witnesses and to be a disciple and to understand our purpose and our mission for who we are and who we are as a church. So tell your story. Tell your God story. Watch this video.
this is your purpose. This is your mission. This is your message. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. We thank you, O God, because you give us the privilege to be disciples and to tell our story, to tell our God story. Help telling our story or evangelism, a difficult thing or a something that makes us nervous. Help us to realize that we don't have any particular words that are supposed to be part of the script. It's just telling our story. It's just telling our God story. And we're privileged to be able to do that for your sake, on your behalf, and for your honor and glory. Help us to tell our story to our friends. Help us to tell our story in our community. And we give you thanks and praise, for we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing our closing song, which is a song on the organ this morning. <laughs> that we would go forth with the power of God this morning. So take with you uh, the love of Jesus Christ, the grace of our Lord, uh, of our Father in heaven, and the power and the very presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go with God.